Okay, here we go. Welcome everybody to Discus, Discus Technique with Roger Einbecker. I'm Dan McQuaid and you'll hear my voice. I'm the host, you'll hear my voice and you'll also hear Roger's voice when, we, uh, when I turn it over to him and he gets started. I just need to go through a little information with everybody first and then um, I'll kick it over to Roger. Anybody who'd like to ask questions, just type them in and then I'll uh, transmit them to Roger. Um, hey, we're, we're uh, sponsored by MF Athletic, your source for everything in track and field. Our guy there for the throws is Rob Lasorza. You can uh, look at uh, MF Athletic's website, everythingtrackandfield.com. You can email Rob at rob.lasorza at mfathletic.com. He's a good-looking dude and a fine, fine uh, – expert on the throws and a great passionate supporter of the throws. So if you need implements, he's your guy. Here's my friend, Roger Einbecker. He uh, has coached for 13 years at Obanzi Valley High School in Aurora, Illinois, suburb of Chicago. In that time, he's produced six indoor state medalists in the shot, nine outdoor state medalists in the shot and disc, four state champions. More importantly, he's a true throws obsessive. I've known Roger for all those 13 years. And he's just does a fantastic job coaching his kids and a fantastic job supporting the sport. And uh, I think you're going to learn a lot from him. So Roger, I am going to turn this over to you. If you want to hit share screen. Okay. All right. There you go. And again, everybody out there, you know, feel free to type in a question and I will share it with Roger. Okay. So uh, the only thing of potential importance here is I do list my email address so that if there's anything that you may think about later question, or if there are some resources that I display here that you might want copies of, uh, you can reach me there. I, I assume they have Dan's um, email as well, and uh, we can always send them out as a bunch to all the participants. So uh, just to kind of get a few things established, um, and, and I don't know the level at which I'm uh, all of the participants here are, as Dan mentioned, I've been coaching high school athletes. I've been fortunate to have some pretty good athletes, um, guys who's, who, who have excelled in a relatively short period of time. And, um, uh, you know, with high school kids, you're going to get a varying level of quality. So a lot of the methods that I end up with uh, really try and speak to the greatest uh, set of those with the hopes that some will make breakthroughs and become better than average throwers and score points for us at conference and potentially thereafter. So discus throw's got a tempo. Uh, throwers are slow at the back, fast at the front. You always want to think about accelerating the discus. There are any number of times when I see my throwers stick their arm and hold their arm. They might be trying to get separation and the discus comes to a halt. I try and eliminate all those things. Always look to be accelerating the discus. Lots of things kids do are not fundamental to the throw to the extent that they are willing and understand. We try to eliminate unnecessary movement. I'm an advocate of the backward seven that, uh, that um, theory or, or whatever you want to call it has been around for a while. Uh, I first heard John Powell, uh, describe it when I either attended a presentation or uh, my son and I went to his throwing camp about, uh, I guess it was probably 13 or 14 years ago. Um, and inexperienced throwers, uh, even though they think they got it, you know, you get a lot of them that want to come flying out of the back. So essentially you find that to make them more effective, to make them actually speed up at the end, you have to slow them down at the beginning. And then you got another set of guys who just kind of have one speed. They go through the ring at one speed. 
And you really need to work with them in order to try to get them to really develop a hit or a sling at the finish. And that obviously um, is going to vary again by the degree of capability of that kid. So this just uh, shows the ring. Uh, I do the 12 o'clock back, 6 o'clock front model. You see the backward seven there. The backward seven is the path through which I'm going to travel. I, the thrower, this is a right-handed thrower. I'm going to travel through the ring. So my feet are always, if I'm doing it right, my feet are always going to be touching some point of that seven, right? That's my model. We use a lot of chalk. At our practices, we draw those backward sevens in the disc rings and the shot rings because that's a real important reference point for our kids. So back of the ring, here we are, we're getting ready to go. I'm, I'm uh, not uh, into the big knee bend or the, you know, kind of dip on the wine kind of thing. I'm more on the, you know, modest knee bend, modest bend at the waist, right? Someone said to me, you know, it's more like sitting on a bar stool than sitting on a chair. That was a kind of an analogy that stuck for me. So that's the one I use here. Uh, younger throwers just kind of whined uh, incessantly. You got to try and get them to just get going on one. Um, a, a, big, a big point is when thrower makes their first movement. Right foot's got to be, and again, this is a right-handed thrower now. Right foot's got to stay on the ground, flat on the ground, all the way until the right leg sweep begins. So that whole winding process, that right foot is down. The left foot may pivot up to the toe, but the right, right foot stays flat on the ground. I don't like to see kids do big weight shifts, and I don't like to see them do big winds. Um, a lot of times the weight shifts don't get the weight shift to the right, doesn't make it back to the left. And a lot of times the wind introduces balance challenges or timing challenges. Um, here again, uh, those of you who are familiar with John Powell, uh, John had a very efficient technique. He said at a conference that I attended that one of the very first things that he decided was, and he, and he admitted he used to have a big wind, he said, I got rid of it because the very first thing I do was I'd unwind. So, why go to the trouble and introduce the possibility of an error or, or throwing myself off balance? So he kind of got, and you can see it on the, the one throw of his where he's, uh, it's kind of his best throw. It's, I think it's at the start of his video. He's got a weightlifting belt on for support, but that arm only goes back. And then, you know, literally the minute his hips start to turn, he stops that wind. So he's really quite tight there. And that's, that's pretty common for him to get to that point and stop. So now I've made my wind. Now I'm going to head into the balance of the throw. So I'm, uh, and I'm calling this out of the back. So my, my next few movements are pivot my left foot. So I've got my, both my feet are more or less pointed back at 12 o'clock. And they're, and they're, you know, for uh, reasonably sized kids, they're going to be close to those sector lines. If you draw your sector lines through the ring, they're going to be back in the back. I'm going to make my left foot pivot to 9 o'clock. I'm going to pivot to 9 o'clock. Typically, I'm going, to, I'm going to lower my center of gravity and shift my weight over my left leg. Wilkin calls it the 9 o'clock drop. You kind, of, you kind of use the reference point of getting your armpit over your left knee. I have left leg there. It's really probably better uh, stated by getting it over your left knee. So at that point, I've moved, I've pivoted, I'm prepared to start my sweep, right? Leg sweeps now. So my right leg now is going around my left side. I got to stay on balance when I do that. This is the hardest thing that my high school kids have to do. We do, we do a lot of work, uh, and, I, and I jump ahead here from, uh, from occasion occasionally, so, so I, uh, I'll, I'll revisit this stuff, but we do a lot of work on linear drills like South Africans because adding that 90 degree pivot coming out of the back and the complexity it adds sounds real simple, but for high school throwers, it makes it a whole lot more difficult. So anyway, 
So we make that, we make that weight shift, we make the pivot, got to stay on balance. So we're pivoting around our left side, right? Now there's kind of uh, a few variations of what that right leg sweep looks like. So the sweep that I refer to and that I would prefer to see is the wide, low right leg, wide, low right leg. The, what I call a swing is one wherein <clears throat> the path of the leg kind of moves back further and then as it comes forward towards the center of the ring, it's closer to the left leg. So it's almost a little pendulum-like as the, as the right leg picks up, moves wide to the swing at the back, and then comes by the left as the thrower moves to the middle. There's throwers that do that. Um, I just don't prefer that. And probably the one that most of the high school kids do, at least at the beginning, is the tuck where the right knee and the left knee get side by side, and then they make a pivot, and you get no energy from the right leg as part of the sweep. You want to get that fixed as soon as you can. Left arm, left leg move together as a system. Uh, I don't like to see kids throwing their left leg, left arm open or their shoulder. Um, it's younger throwers don't have the wherewithal to kind of regather themselves as they move to the middle. I'm going to show you an example of where that happens a little later. And, and the last part of that piece out of the back is a really important piece called unseating. So it's the point where you kind of sit in your left hip towards the middle. John Powell calls it falling. And, and literally, it's you're sitting in that hip as you're, as you're beginning that pivot to help you with linear energy to get across the ring. You don't want to see kids just rotate to, to the middle to rotate again. You've got to drive to the middle. Unseating that hip is how you get the drive to get to the, to get to the middle and then, frankly, into the front of the ring. For kids, here's a little fix. For kids that have trouble coming out of the back, have trouble making a good weight shift, have them preload their left side during their wind at the back. Shift their weight to the left have an abbreviated wind. That way, when they're ready to go, the weight's already there. They're almost balanced there. All they got to do is a sweep. Hey, Roger, can I jump in with a question? Yeah. You submitted. You mentioned you're not a uh, fan of big weight shifts. So what for you separates the weight shift out of the back of the ring during the nine o'clock drop from being too much of a shift in weights during the throw? So the, the weight shift that I was trying to make reference to, if this, um, if this clarifies that comment a little bit, is kids that make a big shift to the right over their right leg on the wind and then back over their left when they're making that first weight shift to the 9 o'clock drop. I don't want to see them push too much weight to the right because it, it's more difficult than, than not to get back to the left. That was what I was trying to say. Now, I don't know that it, did, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, and if not, the person who submitted that, please feel free to ask a follow up, and we'll get that in there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm. That's what I would kind of put under the heading of eliminating unnecessary movement. That wind and weight shift to the right at the very beginning of the throw is something that I try and eliminate. I try to get that weight shift to the right out of there before take it out of the thrower. So here's the guy that I like uh, technically as good as anybody I've ever seen. This is Wolfgang Schmidt. It's an older video. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have the detail that we might like and that we'll see in some others, but that's what uh, Wolfgang looks like after he comes out of the back. Now he's a big, tall guy, 6'6", six, six, getting to the middle and to the front of the rings, nothing for him, but that's what he looks like. Now, the things that are important here for him are, and in this, in this movement is, you want to see, this is the hip coming in right here. You want to see this angle between the left foot and the hip. That hip needs to get stuck in. But you also want to see this part remain upright, and you want to see the shoulders and arms level, all of which he's doing. And here's his right leg sweep coming around here. You can find this video on YouTube, and if you do, you'll see he gets his right leg up and started into that sweep really quick. 
He does not lag his right leg at all. It gets involved really quick. I think that's the better way to do it. That tends not to be the way most kids do it, but I think that's a really excellent way to go. Now, this got posted on uh, Facebook uh, not too many weeks ago, and I, I grabbed the picture because it was a really clear picture. Um, this, and uh, note the cage here, or absence thereof, but uh, this is Mac Wilkins, of course, and, and look at him, look at how he's really set that, sit that hip in here, right? He's really got a tilt going on. Um, I'm not exactly sure because of the, of the picture what our angle is on that, so we might be getting a little bit of a, a different impression because of where the photographer is relative to the side of the ring, but nevertheless, he's really lit, leaned in, Torso's upright, shoulders level, really good. Uh, Illinois has had some real good uh, high school throwers of late. Here's the kid uh, that has the best throw in Illinois history, Dan Bach, at about 209. He's a two-time state discus champion. He's, he's got that same hip-to-foot ratio, ratio here, or relativity, torso's upright, Shoulders level, arms extended. Uh, this is my son. He was a state champion also. Same kind of relationship here, right? Good sweep. Torsos up. Uh, arms, shoulders, shoulders level, arms extended. He's got a little more separation showing up than Dan did. Now, I'm going to also mention that uh, I use different cameras, and some of them have uh, more frame capabilities, so I might get more choices and, and might get more details in certain picture sequences than others. And I, and I suspect this one I had more uh, choices than Dan's or than this one here with Alex Thompson, another fine thrower from Illinois, who uh, competed with Dan up at Wisconsin, Alex through 2.0. Two uh, 201 or 202 in high school, and Alex is not a big guy. Uh, in fact, I, I would be surprised if in high school he, he was much over 200 pounds, if that, but excellent technician here again, uh, good relationship, hit to foot, torsos up, shoulders level. He's got a good uh, bit of uh, separation showing up there too. Now, this was a picture I took years ago, and this kid here was a, a reasonable thrower for me and a pretty smart kid. And I probably spent five or 10 minutes with him trying to get him to sit his hip in to get his torso upright, right, to emulate this position. And this is the best I could get him to do. So I only took the picture of him to kind of mollify him for, you know, this five or 10 minutes of work, right? That's not what we want to do. So this is what we want to do. So really what you got to do is you got to find a, a wall where you get the kid so he's, he's got the hip up against the wall, the shoulders against the wall, the leg is, right leg is sweeping here, shoulders are level. That's the, that's the position that you want to uh, try to achieve. That's the one, not this one. This is real common though. We'll see this on lots and lots of high school throwers. That's how they're going to come, into, come out of the back and go into the middle. That's what they're going to look like. That's not what we want. Now, one of the drills that I find to be very, very useful at uh, unseating is just simply uh, get a partner and get a towel. And the kid in the back on the left there is holding all of the weight of that thrower with that towel so that they can feel like they can get the feeling of what it means to set that hip in. That's really important. And I will almost guarantee that 100% of the time when you get kids to do this, they're going to sit that hip in and they're going to drive further across the ring. That's what you want them to do. That's where they're going to get momentum. They're going to get linear energy, linear, linear momentum. And that drill right there works really good to help that get done. Uh, another drill, which I used often, is uh, drilling to a target here. Just let me change my 
pointer. Uh, whoops. So I need to go like this. This is So in this case, what we're doing is we're sweeping to a target that's back in the ring. Thrower's still, now this is the lefty, of course. His thrower's got to stay over his, um, thrower's got to stay over his right leg in this case. Good weight there. Good, good balance there, I should say. Nice sweep, shoulders level, right? Now he stopped, that gives him a target. That gives him the sense of what that wide sweep's all about. And then he finishes here with a South African motion, which. So Roger, he's aiming with his foot, he's aiming for that weight plate. He's aiming for that wide. weight plate, exactly right. He's aiming for that weight plate. And another variation of the 360 drill is one in which you want to create and maintain separation, not just do a 360, but create and maintain separation through the whole drill. That's, uh, that makes that drill a lot, a lot harder. And by the way, as your kids get better doing the 360, you want them to slow down. The slower they can do this, the better they're gonna be. So here, Starts that, there's his nine o'clock drop right there, right? We see the arm and the discus back behind the shoulder. Here's his pivot, right? There's that separation again, right here, right? There's his separation. And he maintains that through the pivot. That's real important. Lots of, lots of kids come out of the back and their arms and shoulders are, uh, excuse me, their arms, shoulders, and hips are all in the same plane. That's zero separation. Um, another thing that helps with balance is uh, 360s with weight overhead. This is a good drill. You can do this with uh, weight and use two hands or one hand, but it's a good drill. This one helps a lot. We do this a lot too. In fact, we'll see another variation, a couple of variations of that later in this video uh, also. So that's what we're looking for coming out of the back. That's the position that we're looking for coming out of the back. That's our objective, right? Hey, there. Roger, can we go back to that last drill real quick? Yeah. Hey, so, so what cue are you using with his feet here? He's turning his left. And is he, is he, do you want him getting the right foot moving as quickly as possible? Yep. You... yep. And in fact, it's almost a little push off with the right. Okay. Uh, I heard Gadina say at one of those NTCA uh, conferences in, I think it was in, at Portage High School, you know, it's like, like you're on a skateboard and you're pushing off with your right foot on a skateboard, but that's what you want to do. So he, he, turns, he turns the left heel and then pushes off quickly off the right. Correct. Right, right foot. Yeah, this is throwing shoes on a tile floor. These are, this is a fast surface, right? But yeah. uh, that's what you want to do. Okay. Okay, so now we've come out of the back. Now we're driving in the middle. We want well, shoulders remain level. That we talked about. Keep the torso upright. Don't lead in. Don't lead in with your head. This is, this is kind of where orbit now starts to become important. Uh, orbit is the path in which the discus, if you could uh, just single out the path of the discus in the, in the entire throw, that's the, whole, that's the whole orbit, right? So uh, low and high points in the discus, low is always at the back of the ring, away from the sector. High is always at the front of the ring, uh, towards the sector, right? And wherever those low and high points align for you as a thrower, that's pretty much where you're going to throw. So paying attention to this is important. Uh, as you come out of the back and drive to the middle, you're going to move from a low point to a high point. This is a real critical thing. And we've got a few examples of some elite throwers who, you know, have high points that are unbelievable. But um, it's important because staying on orbit or staying on plane means that there's 
no, ideally, or very little rerouting of the discus up and down to get back on orbit to, orbit to make your delivery. Uh, the other thing I want to make a comment on too here is you got to watch, this is really kind of a uh, uh, cause and effect kind of thing. If you, when you sweep your right leg out of the back and your leg is too high, it's going to cause your hips to tilt and your torso to tilt. So you got to be careful about that. I advocate a lower right leg sweep. Uh, I have had kids who have high kicks and it does in fact cause that right hip to be high, the left hip tilts down low to balance, right? Torso balances, counterbalances the, the higher, wider right leg, and you got a big tilt. Uh, we took those uh, mini hurdles, stood it on end, right? So, so instead of in the kind of hurdle mode, if you will, stood it on end and used that as a target through which to sweep the right leg for a couple of those throwers. We did that a lot. I'd love to tell you it was 100% effective. I think it got the throwers thinking about it, but it has to be done a lot of times. And the other thing you got to watch is throwers who fold the right knee as they make their sweep uh, because if that extension, if that leg extension is late and the thrower keeps pivoting, you will over-rotate 100% of the time. So that's, that's an important thing. Now, there's a video here we're going to see pretty quick. Uh, Gerd Cantor, the uh, great thrower from Estonia, who does a fold, but he gets his leg extended real fast, so there's no delay but a lot of kids will fold that leg and keep pivoting. And then as they extend the leg, they keep, they keep pivoting and now they've over-rotated and now you're in the soup. And cutting the corner out of the back is a little bit of uh, young throwers who are in a hurry to get to the middle. Don't complete that weight shift again. They wanna get in the middle. So they're sitting in, they're diving in or they tuck that left shoulder in in order to get to the middle faster, but all they do is create a balance problem. Uh, the other part about driving here now is you have to jab off your left foot. You gotta drive off your left foot. If you don't, I, I have a thrower here, I, I just, uh, it was, he drove me crazy this year, he, he could not consistently jab off the right foot. His means was throwing his right leg forward. So uh, instead of seeing, uh, as we will here in a second, I'll, I'll go to here, instead of seeing, uh, here's Wolfgang going to the middle with a nice kind of a sprint looking right leg, right? Kind of a sprint step here. My guy would have his right leg extended and he, he'd use it to pull him into the middle. Uh, unfortunately, he developed a groin pull at the end and he just could not get the concept of jabbing off the left. You've got to jab off the left. That's critical. Uh, and as you'll see here, you're driving chest facing the sector. So you've got to watch that kids don't continue to rotate coming out of the back, right? We have to have an instant of drive into the sector, delay that rotation just a little bit, get off the ground, then begin to rotate. Don't just rotate when the left foot's on the ground. And I'll show you that later in a video too. Whoops. Um, again, you wanna have your throwing arm lagging the body. Uh, one of those uh, National Throwers Coaches Conference said, I think it was a guy named Mike Young, who's a biomechanist, said that uh, you know he'd watched watch lots of videos. The, the, the average degree of separation that he felt throwers could maintain through this part of the throw was about 30 degrees of separation. That doesn't seem unreasonable. We'll, we'll see some of that, maybe a little more. But what you don't want is as you get to this position, having your arm and your hip literally flush on the same vertical plane. That's no good. Hey, so, Roger, can I sneak in a quick question? Yep. What verbal cues do you use to emphasize keeping the chest up in the middle of the ring like, like our guy Wolfgang's doing there? Uh, 
I don't know that I've got a good verbal cue for that. I do take a lot of videos. So when kids get into that mode, I stop them right away and show them what they're doing. Uh, here's where doing drills with weight overhead makes throwers have to stay upright and on balance. That's really important. That, that I believe we get more carryover from than anything else that we do relative to keeping the torso up. Would you ever use uh, a focal point in drills where it looks, I mean, like you could see like Wolfgang is just about looking out at the sector there. Yep. 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 I say it all the time. I say that all the time. Um, you know, I guess as a coach, I'm probably second guessing myself a lot, <laughs> particularly when I watch a lot of kids continue to do the same thing, but but that's perfect, right? And if I may, there's Dan Block again. Now, Dan's lost a little, at least in this frame, Dan's lost a little of his separation here. You'll see his arm is not too far behind his hip. That's what I was talking about, that uh, 30 degrees that Mike Young suggested, but very good torso up. There's the sprint step. And I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just uh, doing a, a different thing. This is where... Um, so here's Alex Thompson again. Uh, I'd say that's considerably more than 30 degrees. Good sprint step here. And there's Brett. Brett also has a lot of separation. Good sprint step. Now he's starting to turn his head a little, but I think chest-wise and drive-wise, he's in pretty good shape. So again, what, what, Roger, what you're trying to avoid is a, a situation where the, the thrower's shoulders are turning. So we can see... When the leg is here, we might see their back rather, yes. than, rather, exactly. rather than, than, them, than seeing them lead with their chest. Exactly right. Okay. Now, uh, feet are an important part of this coming out of the back. This is an older video. It didn't uh, transfer so well. This is Virgilia Select now. And there's his feet, so we'll watch these. But this is an important part also. So we're gonna do this. So here we go. Here we go, right? So here's, he starts, gets that, he pivots that left really quick, gets it set, almost keeps it there, right? So there is his right coming up. Not much more, not just a little bit of turn right there, just a little. Now here's his drive. You can see clearly him driving off that foot right there. Now we lose, we lose him in frame here for a second. But as we pick up the right foot again in the middle, uh, and now we, he probably got a little bit of turn in on us. So um, I think it's safe to say that he got his right foot pointed at 12 o'clock on touchdown. Now he's a little past that now, but he's uh, surely rotating. And there he is in delivery. And we'll pick up the sector line here. Now he's into his reverse to see where he is in reference to that reverse seven. Pretty close. Pretty good throw there. Good, good view of the feet. Now here's a nice, clean, very high-def version of Gerd Cantor. Uh, this was uh, London Olympics, right? So we're going to watch him. Here's his 9 o'clock drop. There's his 9 o'clock drop right there. All right, that's... That's pretty good. There's his left arm pit over his left knee. Uh, I've got to switch my pointers back. Whoops, pointer, pointers, point, 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 point. Then here's his fold, but here's his extension. Right leg's folded here as he picks up. Right here, it's extended already. So he manages that really fast. Sits the hip in, he's got a good angle going on there. Sits the hip in, drives to the middle, good push off, right? Turns in the air, lands a little better than three o'clock, maybe 2.30ish, something like that. Well balanced over the right leg, left gets down fast, little, little, Outside the sector, probably good on the reverse seven. And away he goes. Nice throw for him. We'll get that ink off of there. 
So again, pivot the left. I think in both of these we'll see, and I got one that's gonna come in later, we're gonna see that that left foot, none of these guys let it turn further than down the sector. Nobody lets the left foot turn toward the left sector line even, it's down the sector, down the middle of the sector. That's the point at which they gotta get out of the back. Get off the left foot, get out of the back. This is another drill I picked up off the internet. I was gonna look for the URL and post the URL for people that wanted to see this, uh, but I couldn't find it again. So this is a uh, kind of a hand slap drill where uh, the thrower is gonna take his throw. And this is, this is a little bit of a preloaded left side here. That's what I meant earlier on that, uh, when you got kids who aren't good weight shifting, this, this guy's got his weight loaded on the left side. But here he goes with his left, he's trying to hit the coach's hand there. And now he's coming around with the right, trying to hit the hand there again. Makes him get over that. There is armpits nicely over the left knee, left armpit over left knee, drives to the middle, good balance, bang. That was a good deal. That's a nice drill, we use that as well. Hey Roger, got a, a comment here. Um, I think you always have to be mindful of losing the elasticity of the chest, overstretching the chest and losing the rubber band effect with the separation of the discus, just in reference to having too much separation. What do you I think agree. is possible to have I, too much? I agree. You, you, you really, it only becomes useful at the end. So I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, and I, I, I guess I need to be careful. I wasn't advocating in earlier videos more separation at that point, but uh, I, I think you need to achieve the 30 coming out of the back as suggested by Mike Young so that you have some separation heading into the middle. Otherwise, what you do is you end up having to hold your left, uh, excuse me, hold your right arm still so your discus decelerates or stops as you let your body get ahead. But, but I agree. We don't want too much separation coming out of the back. I agree with that. Hey, Roger, could you, could you elaborate on that concept of the 30 degrees? Could you, could you maybe uh, illustrate that? So, uh, let's see if I can find it here. So right there, this is the, this, and, you know, assuming I could get this on the correct plane, right, this is the 30 degrees that I'm talking about. So it's from here to here. Okay. That's what I'm trying to measure. And I, I think that's probably, it's not 45, that's less than 45, that's probably in the neighborhood of 30. I think that's probably reasonable. And I think that's all you need to, what we don't want to see is that left arm and left hip going around together. Then you have no separation. You've got to, you've got to regain it or recapture it in the middle of the ring. And so that's what you've got to, you've got to, then you've got to slow your discus down. And that's late in the throw to be slowing your discus down. So if a coach is filming from this angle, they want to see as that right leg sweeps past the left, you want to see some air here, some space between. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I can. I think you don't I want it right over the hip. You want to see some space here. Yeah. Okay. That's what you're talking about there, right? Yeah, actually, that last frame I was talking about. Yeah, right. As this, as the uh, right leg passes the left, we want we want some space between that discus in his body. Yes, okay. correct. Yeah, I don't have a good one of, can I have an older one of Cantor from, uh, from the side, but, um, but this was such a good picture from the back, I thought it would probably show up better on the webinar. Okay, and then uh, for uh, kids who, who just can't get that uh, right leg out front, there's a couple of fairly simple jab drills. We were doing those on our high jump pits. Had my kids doing that this year. 
this was a video that I uh, took from a presentation that Mike Turk made. And, and it's shot put oriented, of course, but it's uh, still relevant to the discus. So those drills help as well. Hey, Roger, that drill, is he pushing off his uh, back yes. foot? Pushing off the left foot. And is that the emphasis of the drill, pushing off the left foot as you lift? Pushing off the left foot, but the uh, thing you want to accomplish is this, right? That, that leg right here. It's a little uh, exaggerated here because he's got to clear the okay. height of the high jump pit. Right. But it's this, it's getting this leg out in front. That's the, that's the part of the drill that you want. So again, right. this is this is teaching the kid to find that Wolfgang Schmidt position. Yep, yep. exactly right. Okay. That one. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, so flight or non-support, I, I believe you got to get in the air. Most discus throwers get in the air. You, even rotational shot throwers, probably most of them get in the air. A lot of kids will be steppers, right? So they'll... Uh, They'll always have at least one foot on the ground when I come out of the back. You know, my left, my left barely leaves the ground and my right's on the ground. So my, my left is way back in the ring. I got to get it all the way to the front of the ring before I can begin my throw. So you got you to gotta use that hip falling in and jab to get linear drive going. You got to turn in the air. You, you really need to drive into the front of the ring. Uh, again, orbit's important. This is the, this is the part of the uh, throw that the orbit starts to show up big. Lead with that right leg to the middle. That's what we were just talking about. That's that jab drill. You know, you tighten your levers a little bit to gain speed like a skater, right? So the left arm starts to wrap a little bit. That keeps the shoulders closed as well. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Larry Judge uh, described that right leg sweep as kind of like half a heart. So it's not a semi, it's not a semicircle in its sweep pattern. You're actually pulling it in uh, at the, as the right leg passes the left, you're pulling it into the middle to create more rotational energy there and pull those hips through. And then to the extent that you can keep your left leg closer to your right leg when you pivot in the middle and don't sweep a big wide left, which is gonna slow you down again, that's important. We call that kissing your knees. And Powell is an advocate of keeping your feet low. He and Oldfield uh, emphasize that a lot in their camps. So for those kids who don't wanna get off the ground, coming out of the back, we put hurdles in there. And these work pretty darn good. Now this is a little taller hurdle than I normally use. I, I use one about half that size, but that works pretty good. That gets them off the left and they got, and you can kind of vary where you set that hurdle to cause them to drive a little more if necessary. So that's, that's a, a big deal. Uh, right foot touchdown, don't extend the leg, uh, let the ground come to you. Land on the ball, the right foot. Most elite throwers, uh, we saw uh, them coming down with uh, right foot pointing back at 12 o'clock, back at the back of the ring. Three o'clock should be kind of our minimum objective. If you, you know, if you got right foot coming down, pointing at like five or something like that, boy, you're, you got to turn your right foot really hard, really fast. So you're not slowing your uh, lower body down. And, and the kids that I've had, just aren't successful at making that work. So you got to get them to land with that toe minimum point at three o'clock, if not, you know, heading towards 12. Don't drop the right heel. Um, you know, drive into the front again. Don't rotate to a rotation. Drive to a rotation. And always check your foot positions, right? Stay on that backward seven. And right foot touchdown is the point at which you've got the highest part of the orbit. Now, that's Wolfgang Schmidt. So he's got a really high orbit here, really high. Great weight distribution over his right leg. This might have been uh, one frame advanced. I think his left might actually, a right foot touchdown, be more like here. But it's not far from where it is. He, he really gets in a terrific position. That's just poetry in motion. 
Now here's one of the current phenoms. I'll play her at full speed. And it's got a slow-mo background. So we'll watch her pivot. Whoops, 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 whoops. So her, here's her nine o'clock drop. Now, I don't know if you can be double jointed in your ankles and knees, but she's got her left foot pivoted, almost pointing down the sector, and her right foot still on the ground. I, I can't imagine that my body could ever do that, but she can make it work. And she doesn't turn much after that, as you can see, right? So pointed down the sector. There's a little fold, she straightens out. Now here again, now arm to body here, she's, she's still got a fair amount of extension here. In fact, we're gonna see in the next few, she's got uh, the guy who asked the question about the chest elasticity, there's a position here that's just mind boggling. So there she lands, now she's landing at three o'clock, right? But she definitely jabs off, definitely jabs off, lands here, gets into the, Thing. Now, this is the one that's really from a different angle, shows up here. Check this out. Bang. Here's your right foot touchdown. Look at that. Look at that. She's got at least 90 degrees of separation on her arm at right foot touchdown. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. Now, nobody's ever going to get that. She's, she's just got, you know, a, a real unique body type but that's an amazing position there. Hey, Raj, for someone, you know, like us who's coaching uh, more uh, normal humans, um, are you okay with a different range for different throwers as far as the angle of the right foot when it lands? I'm always shooting for 3 o'clock. Okay. I'm always shooting for 3 o'clock. That's kind of my minimum standard. I, I just don't think kids that, kids that can't get their toe to 3 o'clock cannot get their feet turned fast enough and end up either under rotating so they block themselves off at the front of the ring mm -hmm. or uh or their slow or their uh the rotation slows down so much they got nothing to finish with if you don't get there i just don't think you can make a throw that's you know got much on it and are you okay if your throwers turn farther than that turn almost back to 12 like oh yeah absolutely Absolutely. So it just kind of depends on the kid and his flexibility or whatever. Yeah, so, so this is where the steppers really have a hard time. You know, if you don't get in the air, you can't turn your feet. You can't land in that position. You've got to get in the air. The more you're in the air and the more you use your right foot to help your, your hips turn, the more likely you are to get that foot pointed back to 12 o'clock. So there's Dan Block. Nice position there. Good orbit. Hey, and if I can jump in one more time, sorry yep. to keep interrupting. Could you comment on orbit? Now, you, the, the three people you've shown so far have what I would call a very high orbit. Yes, other, I agree. Other throwers agree. Are a little flatter. What, what are you looking for from your throwers? I want, I want my kids to try in this position, try to get close to shoulder height. Okay. So you're fine with a flatter. So, you, so if the disc is. I still want them, I still want them lower in the back. Mm -hmm. But I'll accept, you know, kind of shoulder height here. Okay, got it. Now that's, there's Alex. Alex is closer to shoulder height. Yeah, so that's, he's within a range that you feel like is Yep, good. absolutely, I'd take that. What you don't want to see, and what a lot of kids do, is they got that discus is on their hip, you know. Right. So now you're way off orbit, and now you're going to have to make a big correction, and you're going to have a real steep, throwing trajectory because uh you know you've got this discus here on a plane that's going straight down and you know you got to get it up to shoulder height at release it's going to be really steep it it just it isn't going to work well hey, roger got another question here yeah. and you're, you're probably on your way to talking about this but the question is what is your opinion on getting the blocking leg down sandra kind of drags her leg where, where others keep the knees closer to get the foot down faster People have thrown. Uh, far I want ways. the knees closer. Right. I want the knees closer. Yeah, I used the terminology back here. Uh, kiss the knees. 
Right. So I, I, so I don't like the dragging of the, of the left leg. I want it to be closer. I think that's what you're asking, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's Brett. His orbit is a sl slightly over shoulder height, right? He's probably just a shade inside three o'clock. Right. Um, and then transition to power position from the right foot touchdown. You got to get that left down quick. You got to, you, you know, that's really what sets you up and makes you ready to go. Uh, a lot of kids make a short step. So some work has to be done to make a reasonable left leg extension. If you land tall in the middle, if you reach with your right leg, you're going to be tall. It's going to be hard to get your left leg down. So you got to land with a bent left, a bent right leg. Uh, you know, if you've got a bad power position, if you land in a bad power position, you're going to have a hard time making a good throw. And again, if you're, if you don't get to the three o'clock range, you're going to have a hard time making a full pivot by the time you want to put your left foot down. So you're going to block yourself off. Your left foot's going to come down early. You know, you're going to be pointed way to the right somewhere. That's not going to work either. Uh, watch that you don't shift your weight off your right leg after touchdown. Don't let the hips drift forward. Uh, one thing that I'm going to go back quickly to Sandra here and move to the front of this video right here. In fact, so here's, yeah, there's a, that's a pretty wide sweep, at least from this angle. Yeah. I agree that that left is way out there, right? Hard to argue with somebody that throws 230 all the time, but nevertheless. <laughs> Or somebody that could beat you up. Uh, yeah, that too. So there she's down. Now, here's – so she's still over the right, shoulders back, still got good uh, good separation, everything going here. Now, here's the part. So she's not letting her hips drift this way, which, of course, you know, she's the best. She wouldn't do that. Our high school kids do this all the time. So that that – the point of that left hip – you know, lots of times kids are going to just slide it laterally. That's how they're going to move to the throw. Throw is more of a, a push than it is a rotation. And then she gets that left foot down and she blocks that thing. So now all she can do is rotate those hips. They can't go any further forward, right? Here we go. Now we're just rotating. In fact, she blocks so hard here that right about there, her left leg almost looks slightly hyperextended. That, but throwing as hard as she does, I'm not surprised. Uh, watch your head. If, you, if you're peeking over your shoulder, you're going to influence your shoulders. It's going to cause you to open early. Uh, when you get that left foot down, keep that right foot turning, drive, drive the, pivot the right foot, drop the knee in, then drive the right hip. That's what's going to create that. This is really where you maximize your separation. This is really where you want to get the uh, stretch reflex back to that uh, point that was made earlier about uh, getting too much separation too early in the throw. I agree with that. This is the point at which uh, separation really matters. Hey, Raj, now, can I jump in? Can I jump yeah. in with another question yep. real quick? Uh, do you think the dragging blocking leg, like Sandra there? is more common in non-reverse throwers than in reverse throwers? I don't think, I don't think I've noticed a difference. I, I don't think that, I don't think whether you reverse or not, I haven't studied it from that perspective. So I, I'm, I'm just surmising maybe that it wouldn't matter, but I don't know that from having studied them. Hey, and uh, another question, and I, you're, this is probably getting a little bit ahead, but in the power position, do you coach to pull the disc more from 6 to 12? Um, I don't use the terms there. In fact, um, in fact, you know, the, so, so that kind of leads me to a little bit of where, where does one start their strike? And what I mean by strike is – the last, you know, kind of most violent part of the acceleration of the rotation. So we're always going to be turning, but once the, once the left's down, once I've pulled my left arm across and created and opened up my chest, now I'm going to really fire the whole right side and the right arm. Um, 
I, I demonstrate, I demonstrate more of firing at around 12 o'clock, fire striking around 12 o'clock. Uh, if you start to strike earlier than that, I'm afraid m most kids won't be able to hold on and a lot of those throws are gonna end up right. So I have more difficulty with high school throwers wanting to strike early and they throw right. So I try to get them to think about striking at about 12 o'clock. You're gonna accelerate from six o'clock to 12 o'clock for sure, but the strike is gonna be the last part of that. Heen Raj is another follow-up question that uh, deals with that same issue. How do you keep your throwers from peaking? And I'm assuming that means the age old problem of when the feet come down, looking and turning yeah. the head rather than turning the hips. Yeah. Well, I, I, I create targets for them to keep, keep focused on focal points now become really important for their kids with that problem. Um, and I think you wrote, didn't you write an article in the blog about, how to do that with a towel tied to the back of the cage. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. That, that kind of stuff is the same stuff that I do. And that was for, for those of you that, that haven't memorized my blog. Um, <laughs> that was a drill where we tied a towel to the very back on the fence, uh, the cage. And, you know, we asked the thrower when he hits the power position, I say he, because I coach guys, but he or she hits the power position that they be able to see that towel just for a sec as they drive into the throw. Just, just as a way to try to, to calm that head down so they don't peak. So now these uh, drills are, they kind of fall into the, uh, you know, uh, pivots with weight. They're, they're sequent, uh, they're uh, uh, like South Africans in sequence. We call them line drills. Again, they're kind of, they have a little bit of a shot put orientation, but they're, as relevant for the discus but as you'll see we make them more and more challenging so that being upright being on balance becomes more critical with each with each one of these so here we use a, a power ball and this keeps the feet turning got to keep the feet turning here that's the big part of this drill right keep the feet turning so now we go from a power ball to tires And because that was done with relative ease, we, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. We'll do that one more time. We make him go uphill. That is hard. That really works your balance. That really makes you stay over your pivot legs and work your feet. That's, that's the value of those drills. We do a lot of these. My kids hate these with a passion, but I do a lot of them. Uh, not necessarily this one up the hill. Kids got to be pretty good to, for me to send them over the hill. Uh, so block and release, we're kind of getting down to the end of the throw here. Block and release, object, object of the block is to widen the throwing radius. You know, you've been, as we move through the ring, we're kind of rotating around our spine. By stopping our left side, which is a left side block, we increase the radius from the spine to the left side of the body. Uh, so we've got a longer throwing radius, increases the speed of the right side, blocks the left. We saw a good job of Sander making a great block at the front of that. Left arm kind of fires over to start the upper body. Uh, and, and I talk about firing the whole right side, not just the arm. Fire the whole right side. Continue to drive the hip. Continue to fire the whole right side. Um, right shoulder really only catches the hip at release. I, I don't want kids to have any tension in their throwing arms. Talk about like wet noodle or a rope or something like that. Target is releasing at shoulder height, right? We shoot for a trajectory around 30 degrees. Always want kids to try to get the plane of their discus to match their throwing trajectory. So that's hand position. Uh, we lose, my God, we must lose thousands and thousands of feet a year 
because we have a lot of kids who throw with a nose up discus. Um, so I talk about it to them all the time. It's hand position all the time. The only drill that I've, uh, that I've found that really helps trying to work hand position is something I call the skip drill. So you get a couple of kids and you set them, you know, 50 feet apart or 60 feet apart or something like that. And they're skipping their discus to the other kid, you know, throw at his ankles, skip it to him like skipping a, a stone off a pond, right? So we want it. We don't want to lob it and drop it. I want to throw it hard and, you know, skip it off there so that I, I focus on a really flat, hard, thrown discus. Uh, that works That works. release positions with a realistic, uh, with a realistic release point. You know, we do bowling of the discuses and stuff like that and throw the, you know, the kind of the arm where you're throwing it straight up in the air. But this one I think has the most transfer because you're actually throwing it like a discus. And, uh, meaning the release is in the air, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so here's uh, Schmidt at delivery. He's the only delivery position I have. But I, uh, the thing that's the most important here to me, now there's another case of what looks like, uh, again, as almost a hyperextended left-legged block, is how his body is balanced between his right and left feet. So many of my high school kids want to get their weight all the way up over their left foot, right? But if you're blocking correctly, your weight will not travel up over your left foot. That's what we want kids to look like right there. Now, this drill here is a, is a wheel drill, but it's, it's just a jump. And there's not much magic to this, but here's where I found this thing to be important. If you've got kids that have a slow left foot to the front, I oftentimes cue them by having them try to, and maybe I simplify the drill by making it a South African instead of a full, land at the front, don't land on the right and do a left foot touchdown, land, try and land simultaneously. Now they gotta really think about rotating in the air and getting that left foot down fast. That's where this jump wheel starts to get closer to that kind of a finish. I, I, I think this is more kind of changing the thrower's concept of what they're doing in the middle of the ring in terms of rotation and getting that left foot down fast than anything. That's what this is trying to do. Hey, Raj, can I sneak in another question? Yep. yep. Those of you that are submitting these, thanks. These are excellent questions. What recommendations do you have to keep throwers from jumping before the release? Yeah, that's a killer. That's a killer. Um, that's uh, – you know, when I – don't, I don't have an answer that works every time, but when throwers start to do that, when a thrower starts to do that, we'll go to non-reverse throws. We'll go back to non-reverse throws because to them, they, it's become kind of, you know, mechanical or they think that the execution, the reverse is uh, – you know, contributing to the distance or something like that. But in fact, as you know, as soon as you pick up your right foot, you know, you're not putting, you're not applying force anymore. So chances are your discus is decelerating, not, not accelerating. So I just, you know, frankly, I don't let it continue. And we go back and make, um, make non-reverses to try and get them to feel the finish again. Get them to feel the finish. That's where I think there's a lot of value in doing non-reversers, even if you want your kids to reverse, but you'll never quite feel the finish uh, like you do in a non-reverse throw. So, Raj, with your kids that do reverse in competition, do you have them do non-reverse throws every practice? Yep. Any idea what the percentage might be? between reverse and non-reverse? I, uh, I do, um, you know, I'll do, uh, I rarely let kids reverse from the front and I rarely let them reverse from, uh, you know, half turns or wheels. So all those are gonna be non-reversers. 
and then depending on the de you know how dependable their uh, their you know the timing of their reverses, I may or may not let them do more reverses than non reverses as we go to South Africans and fulls. So way more than half, way more than half, probably at least eighty percent of our throws, even for the better throwers, are going to be non reverse throws. And uh, another question pertaining to the front of the ring here. How can you keep the throwers from shifting their weight from the right to the left side at the front of the ring? Well, that's where you really got to, you know, that's all making your block good. Um, <laughs> there again. So I'm going to show you something that, that, uh, that, I, that I have had some success with. I'll show you in a, in a second here. Uh, because it shows up uh, bad in one drill and better, but not correct in the next drill. Um, and then I'll, and I'll speak to that. I'll speak to that. This was just a drill I found on uh, somebody's website. I think this might be Dave Hahn at, uh, he's at Wisconsin Stevens Point, I think. But it's a fast left foot drill. So, uh, not having much else to do besides this, I found this to be useful to that extent, right? So anything to get the feeling. Now, here's my, uh, here's my uh, test case, the late great Brian Oldfield throwing the discus. So uh, I haven't seen but a couple of, uh, and this might be the only pro version of him throwing the distance that I know of. And by the way, I got these from him. He, these were on uh, Super 8 millimeters and digitized them, and they're all over the internet now. But in any event, so here's, uh, so here's ver his version of the 9 o'clock drop. Well, he doesn't quite get his left armpit over his knee, so he kind of what I call cuts the corner. And you'll notice the back of his hand is facing us here, and we have kids do that. I would prefer that that be flat, and he's leaning in. You see now he, he gets a good drive because he moves his weight over his right leg uh, pretty well, despite the, and he's got a really bent right leg here. And he's, but he's got a lot of torso tilt too. But this is a now, this is a situation where you've got a, a right that's really low by the hip. So his release angle gets a little steep, but he just rips the crap out of this thing. But the bigger thing here on this is, this is rotating to a rotation, which by the way, since, uh, you know, Brian lived nearby me and we uh, uh, had him at a number of our practices. So there's the lean in thing that I want, right? This is great. This isn't so good. This is where I was making a note of having torsos upright. Well, he's leaned in, and there's his drive. So he gets over, and he's you know he's touching down pretty close to twelve o'clock there. So not bad. A lot of torso tilt, arms at the shoulder, but but you'll notice this was what we were talking about, where the head's pointed and the chest pointed, right? This is more a rotating to a rotation, but he saves it with a really with a real punch here, so he gets everything turned. Now look at how much space he's got in the ring too. So he he uses a lot of rotational energy, even though he makes it to the middle, he doesn't use much of the rest of the ring. So he's with, with that position he's demonstrating coming to the middle is what we talked about avoiding earlier, right? Correct. Whereas yes. he's, he's pulling himself into the yes. middle of his shoulders. Unfortunately, Brian is my bad example here. And, and I just, I happened on this. I went through a whole bunch of uh, older guys, and this was one of the ones I saw, and I didn't remember that. Because he, he himself, were he to uh, advocate his discus uh, to-do list, he he's in violation of a lot of them. But... He's such a big, long, strong guy, and this finish just rips the crap out of it. Now, so if you have those genetics, it's okay to yeah, leave. Yeah, you, you can save a lot with a finish like that. You know? Oh, my God. 
Yeah. And, Al Order, and Al Order, for those who've seen Al Order. I wouldn't use Al as a technical model going across the ring, but man, his finish was something else. Yeah. Hey, we have another question come in. Uh, this one's about uh, practice. How many days a week are your throwers throwing full competition throws and how many full throws are kids throwing in practice? So, um, I, I, I'm imagining that most of you are probably Illinois folks listening. Uh, not necessarily so. For Illinois High School, we're permitted to go outside, um, you know, roughly last, last, well, I suppose you could sneak out earlier, but let's just say for the uh, sake of argument, and the weather doesn't really allow much more. Let's say it's fairly predictably last week of March, uh, and by the first weekend in April, you've got meets. So that gives you a season that's about seven weeks long. So we got to get to business fast in the discus because it's over in a hurry. So we've spent now, you know, three plus months doing shot put. Shot put, you know, better be pretty good. Your timing's going to change because you go outdoors. Uh, now you're on concrete instead of wood and the surface speed differences, but, you know, technically you should carry over. So all of that said, I have my kids throw more discus outside than shot put, probably more than two to one, meaning days of discus versus days of shot put. And I'll have kids throw, assuming they've got the throwing volume capacity, 40 or 50 throws a day. Most people won't, uh, won't uh, do much more than that because they get – pretty ragged after that, but that's, um, that's what it is now. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a facet of that question, I think, that it, and it's an interesting facet about competition type throws. I have found that, um, you know, as I go through practice day after day after day and, and, you know, focus kids on particular things they need to work on, that Oftentimes I, uh, I find, or I'm turning kids into, you know, being very technically aware, but not applying a full effort. So, so now I have to say more often, you know, really throw this hard, right? Do what we talked about, but concentrate on throwing this hard. So I would say we can probably get, you know, eight to 10, eight to 10 hard throws on a day when I'm, when I'm willing to make them, or I'm willing to let them make those kind of throws, eight to 10 hard throws. The rest of the time we're, you know, working on technical stuff. And, and if we take the whole day on technical stuff, so be it. But as we approach meets, I want to kind of change their mindset and their nervous system a little bit to throw hard. Uh, and we probably said most of this stuff here, reverse, non-reverse. I think you got to get good at non-reverse first. It, it really lets the throwers feel the release. Uh, you don't want it to be too mechanical and you don't want it to be, it's a reaction, right? It's really just, I'm saving myself from going forward. That uh, Wolfgang Schmidt, you know, he has a, he has a, you know, a really abrupt right leg, reverse in there uh and you can find that video on youtube it's it's he hits the brakes hard on that thing but here i say uh begin all practice non-reverse powers and half turns that's what we do and then uh a lot of times kids find i find kids uh think more about what they're doing than throwing far if they're using something other than a discus so there are, you know, we throw power balls. That was that um, round ball with a handle. Schluter balls is just a, a kind of a variation of a power ball with a rope on it. Throwing balls, re-rod, bowling pills, stuff like that. So uh, I, I put in a couple of videos here. Now this is just a sock and a tennis ball. Now this, this is really to work orbit primarily, but the question of, uh, 
how do they block or now this kid see now there's the point about that came up about shifting too much weight from the right to the left see he's way over his left here right so the the thing i've had most success with in trying to make more effective blocks is south africans where i want the thrower and i don't even think at the beginning i have them throw anything to stop hard at the front of the ring you know i uh in a south african by jamming that left foot down so they'd end up you know ideally they'd end up kind of in this body position but rotated to the finish right i wouldn't let them get that past that body position but i find that having to move across having to make a pivot and then jamming that left foot down and stopping their body, it, it's just, you got to get them to think about, you know, something that is going to stop them from moving forward or rotating further. And, you know, it's just, uh, if you, you know, if you can find a, a good drill, that's the one I've had the most success with. That's it. But this little drill back to the orbit for a minute, you just put one of these in their hands and kids are going to get this orbit better then were they not, or were they to have a discus in their hand, right? So this kid doesn't do a bad job at getting his orbit here, right? Releases at shoulder height, good wide right, arm at the back, boom. And on this one, this is a power ball with a rope on it, same kind of thing. This one he does a little bit. Now this has got a little more weight. He's going to get a little more feedback. This one he does a little bit better job at blocking on. So anyway, those things, those things help. And I think that's it. We've had a lot of great questions throughout the presentation. If anyone uh, wants to throw up any uh, final questions, feel free to do so. Um, hey, and uh, we'll have more webinars to come. Check mickthrows.com. That's our website where we have a blog, and we've got our previous webinars uh, on YouTube linked there, um, and we'll have information about future webinars. Don't forget MF Athletics uh, supports us, and uh, please support Rob Lasorza and MF Athletics. He does great things for the throws. Hey, got a question here, Raj. If you had to pick one drill as your go-to drill, what drill would it be? That's a great question. Uh, my go-to drill. No pressure. I get a lot of I drill? get a lot of mileage out of those tires, doing those rotations with tires, line drills with tires overhead. I get a lot of mileage out of that. Hey, how about can I uh, throw one in? Uh, if you had to choose one elite thrower where, who has, you know, video easily available for a coach to watch, who would you pick to use as a model, as a coach to use as a model? Who's the closest to ideal technique? Well, uh, you know, the better video is, is a more recent phenomenon. So, you know, even in the last four or five years, we're seeing high def stuff come out, which is better that Cantor thing and, and uh, Perkovic is high def. It's a lot better quality, right? And, and the slow-mo frame to frame is just terrific. You know, you go back to Schmitz here in Mac Wilkins area and you've got, you know, you got uh, film to digital and it's just, you know, it's not good. So, so kind of what you end up with is you're almost forced to pick a more contemporary thrower just because the video is better and more widely available. I think I would pick, uh, Gerd Cantor. I think I would pick Gerd Cantor. He's, uh, he's a little more upright and he's a little faster through the ring, but I think that, um, I think he's the guy I'd pick. Another a follow up on that. Uh, how has the constant drill work that you do helped to build your culture of success from new athletes to veterans? Well, <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you that everybody that I have do drills understood why they were doing drills. 
I, I think I explain it to them in many ways, you know, and, and demonstrate. I don't always think that every thrower gets it. The better throwers do. Um, so, uh, you know, oddly, oddly, I think high school throwers, or at least those that I've been uh, coaching for the last few years, tend to think that if they're in the ring and not doing drills, they're doing well. And in fact, I keep telling them that doing drills is really refining points of your technique. There's these, don't think this is being penal. This is, this is important. You might have 80% of it, but the 20 you don't have is killing your throws. That's the part we wanna make better. You're never gonna do it in the ring. You have to do it with drills. So, uh, you know, the wide variety of our abilities at high schoolers makes that question kind of challenging. I think, you know, I had a nice run of kids for about uh, eight or nine years where I was always, uh, you know, with a kid from, you know, upper 160s to break out in the 190s. So I was pretty fortunate that way. Now, last few years, I'm working hard to get kids in the, 150s and 160s but um but i think they i think the smart ones i think the smarter ones get it and you know you feel good when they do it's it's probably looking for uh your satisfaction out of a kid or two maybe then rather maybe across a group of 12 or 15 now that's that's our groups dan dan has is, is, what however they do it they've got a phenomenal recruiting model because he'll end up with 40 throwers to work <laughs> with. and you know i i would have to completely reorient my thinking about how to do that we've never we haven't had half that many uh so i give you a lot of credit for working with big numbers of kids that's why my hair's going gray but i feel like you know with with the, the question about drills when you're when you coach in our climate you don't have any choice but to really emphasize drills because because there's so many times when you, all you have is a hallway to practice in um, or something like that. You, you, your choice is either, well, we're not going to get better today or we're going to do drills. I think, I think Roger, I think you'd agree with me there. Yep. I mean, it's, if you're going to have a consistently solid program, you have no choice but to, to emphasize those drills. I agree. And, and like I said, too, uh, because the outdoor season is so short, you can't waste the day. You've got to do something indoors. And so you're in a hallway and you're doing drills. That's, that's what you got to do. Hey, a couple more questions rolling in here. Uh, when you do goal setting with your throwers, do you emphasize specific meets and distances or extending their season, whether it be conference, regional, state, or nationals? Well, we're always trying to peak for – Conference sectionals and, and uh, state. Uh, now that's that's more, at least for me, uh, has more to do with their weightlifting and peaking than uh, how I change their throwing plans. Because I got to tell you, it's you know it's technique every day for even the best of the throwers. Um, the national meets, you know, the only, my son was the only one that meant, uh, went to national meets. So he threw at Golden West one year and he was fourth at Nike, Nike Outdoor Nationals. Now I think it's uh, New Balance or whoever it is. Anyway, uh, those are challenging because, you know, you got two or three weeks or more uh, past your state meet where where these competitions are held and you're, and you're throwing against the best guys. You know, it's hard for one guy to keep throwing by himself for that period of time. Even, even your kids that qualify for state, oftentimes going to be one guy is throwing for a week, might be by himself, unless you can lure uh, a teammate or two back just to give him a break and somebody to talk to. So though that's a challenging deal. I haven't, uh, I, the only the national things I just faced once and it was hard. That was hard. 
Uh, Brett did a good job, and I probably, you know, since I'm the dad, I could make him do stuff, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I could have made other kids do stuff. That that would have been hard to do. Hey, Raj, are uh, most of your throwers multi-sport athletes, or are they throwers only? Um, I would say almost all of them play football. Almost all of them play football. Um, and it's never been – it's never really been – uh, a problem much. Now, last year I lost two kids for the year coming out of football. One kid had knee surgery and the other had shoulder surgery and they were two of my better throwers. So I lost two kids for a year. And in fact, uh, the kid with the shoulder, so he was, a, he was, um, he threw for me as a freshman, hurt his shoulder as a sophomore football player, had surgery, missed his sophomore year. He only came back on the 12th, right? That was last uh, Tuesday. And, uh, and yesterday, he, uh, while he was doing this, I don't know, throwing a football around, said he hurt his shoulder again, so he, he's not doing anything today. So my, my expectations for uh, – for him have been tempered somewhat because um, I'm beginning to think that shoulder injury is more, uh, is more difficult than I, than he hopes it'll be for sure. Uh, the knee kid will see because he's back in football. So we, you know, he's going to be, he won't have thrown for, you know, he'll throw, he would have thrown in May of 2016. He'll, he'll start throwing again in January of 2018. So, you know, 20 months or something like that. He won't have thrown for 20 months. Football giveth and football taketh away. Yeah. Hey, do you have any uh, recommendations for any camps or clinics for the throws? Well, uh, I don't know. So, as a coach, I love those National Throws Coaches uh, conventions. As a coach, I thought those were just phenomenal. And even the one-day versions in Portage, were, Portage, Indiana, were quite good. Um, uh, Dan and I were talking just beforehand. I saw that was Bill that asked the question. Dan and I were talking beforehand that ITCA, the Illinois uh, Track and Cross Country Coach meeting in January, is going to have Andy Bloom there. Uh, so that will be that will be a nice uh, session or two. Um, but for pure throwing, you know, I uh, I think that guys like um, you know, I think um, Mike Judge in Atlanta, the throw one deep club guy, runs a pretty good camp. Ironwood's pretty good camp. Now, Ironwood has lots of numbers, and they kind of stratify their throwers based on ability. So the more uh, elite coaches line up with, you know, whoever they pull out of the field as the better-looking athletes. So you may or may not get a look by, you know, Mac Wilkins or somebody like that, but they're there. Um there's a lot to be learned for young throwers who don't, haven't gone to coach. So John Powell, I learned a lot. Brett, Brett learned a lot when we went to John Powell's camp. We just went uh, one year, uh, but we took away a lot. And John's still running his camps, I believe. I think he runs one in, uh, in Kansas somewhere. And there's a second one. He doesn't run Denison anymore. I think he's turned it over to Dan Johns. Um, but those are the ones that I have the most familiarity with. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I think we're going to wrap it up. And again, thanks. Thanks, everybody who, uh, who logged in. Thanks for those great questions. And thanks for a great discussion. Check mcthrows.com uh, if you want to look at a video of this. Um, or for information about future webinars, and there will be more. And again, please shop MF Athletics.
Raj, any last uh, comments? Nope, that was it. Uh, hope, uh, hope help. And, and again, if there were things that uh, you want elaboration on or some of these resources or videos, send me an email or send Dan an email and we'll get that stuff back to you. Yeah, and we'd appreciate any, any uh, comments, any questions, feel free to email. All you guys have my email address as well. So we'd appreciate any feedback. Thanks, everybody. And we are uh, going to sign off.